Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Don Upson. Okay, on behalf of the Government Business Executive Forum, welcome to Las Vegas, to CES and to CES Government 2019. And uh, isn't this stage cool? I have to tell you is uh, I had all these remarks that I, that I had uh, written down. It was, and, and I got into my room around midnight, and our team was on the floor downloading videos and putting things in the right way. And I went to bed at 3 and woke up at 5. And I thought, how do you talk about the sponsors that we have, the attendance that we have, the government leaders that came here from the United States, the government from the U leaders from the United States who came, came here on their own dime, the governments that are here from other, please give them a hand. <laughs> CES government has evolved over the last 14 years and we're not just the United States government. We started as a conference that was purely federal Today, we're anchored in the U.S. government, but bolstered significantly by participation from local, state, and U.S. partner nations. And on that, we have Canada, we have Sweden, we have Singapore. We have, uh, of course, in the, we have our partner in the GBF, France. And on that, I want to welcome Colonel Hasse and Colonel Simone and their team from the French military, who are the strong allies of the United States, from the Innovation Division of France, who are here to be with us this morning. So please give them a round of applause. <laughs> what a road to Las Vegas this year. Let me tell you what it was on our end. You all have made this successful, and many of you have been here multiple times. We were so proud to have sold out CES government in November, two months ahead of the conference. And for the first time, instead of like 48 hours, we sent the program to the printer on December 23rd. And a funny thing happened on the way to Las Vegas, I'll tell you that. And we had changes in the program, and when we walked in yesterday, again, when you think of the diversity and who we are now, what this conference is, it's a conference, it is the premier technology conference annual summit for technology leaders from all over the world and from critical infrastructure. But I'll tell you, when our team walked in yesterday, we weren't sure how many would attend. We didn't know what the effect of the shutdown was. We had no idea. And so Mary Shea reduced our numbers a little at the reception. We did all these things. And I wondered when the, when the round table started yesterday, where would we be? Who would attend? Would there be interest? And I saw him put the chairs all around, and I said, I don't want it to look empty. And when the first three opened, you all came and there was standing room only in every one of our round tables. And that's something. And then all but, th we had 336 registrants that showed up yesterday. We had to up our numbers, by the way. And by the way, you all uh, had a good time last night. And um, so it really was an extraordinary day yesterday. And we think that with uh, the agenda, the pre-shutdown agenda, we think was unprecedented in what has been produced for any conference in our sector. We moved from unprecedented to exceptional, and we hope you all find, found yesterday worth of high value, and we hope you find today of high value. And a little bit about what we try to do at CES government. We have 300 people. Most of you know it's primarily by invitation. We put a lot of value on the people who have attended before. We put a diverse mix of people from American government and partner nations. And we design a program that's not a sit and listen conference. We want everyone to leave Las Vegas, having made a new relationship that they didn't have, strengthened one that they might have started, but literally have met someone that's important to either their mission in government or the business that they have in, in, in applying technology applications to government. And our design encourages participation from all of you. There are more than 80 participants in this program that are on roundtables or on, or on the stage. The roundtables are designed three sessions to give all of you an opportunity to meet before they start, to communicate with the people on the roundtable, and to do it again 
after the first session at another one, and again at the session for the third one. And by design, when you get to the reception last night, there's an energy because most of you have already met. And then we want an agenda in our plenary session that's provocative, it's different, that involves people from different jurisdictions, not, uh, and partner nations, and critical infrastructure. Now, I will say that two of our four awardees for the CES Government Technology Leadership Award could not be here for obvious reasons. We've spoken to them. They regret it very much, and they both agreed to do a, an event in Washington where we present them, their awards. And everyone at CES Government, not just the GBF, but everyone registered and attending here will be invited to that event sometime in the spring. So again, we want to provide that kind of value. Now, this stage is pretty awesome, and we've got a great program ahead. As I told you what the concern was coming into yesterday, I also want to thank, we have an amazing audio video team. But we're all in technology, and we all go to conferences, and the PowerPoint always works until you put it up. And we got a lot of technology ahead of us today. So we're very excited about the program, our sponsors. This is our first webcast. Thank you, Gary Newgarden, Pure Storage, Paul Krein, and Red River. Thank you, Verizon, for what you're going to see today. Thank you for all of our sponsors. But let me tell you something. This is a special program, and you all have made it special. This is CES Government 2019, and thank you for being part of it. <laughs> to begin our program, as we have every year, the Government Business and Executive Forum has a great relationship, and one of our strategic partners is the premier research arm in the government tech market, and that is Gavini. And all of you who are here know that Eric Gillespie puts together for every GBF meeting and his team put together an analysis for the subject that we have at hand. And he's here, he always begins our conference. And so it is a pleasure to welcome to the stage the founder and chairman of Gavini. Please welcome Eric Gillespie. Oh. Thanks, Don. Um, it occurred to me last night while we were sipping bourbon and having meaningful conversations about artificial intelligence that there is no other conference on the planet where you could talk about AI with the commander of the International Space Station, the leader of the most meaningful cloud provider in the federal government, a member of Steely Dan, a congressman, and Michael Cohen's attorney. That's about as good as it gets in one room, um, and certainly exciting to, to be here to present. When Don and I first started talking about uh, what the theme of the conference was and, and how we might be able to support that, uh, we came up with uh, a, a build on top of what we have talked about for the last few years. For those of you who were here last year or at the French Embassy this past year, um, we've talked through the four industrial revolutions. And what I'm going to talk about builds on that. And, and um, I'll spend a little bit of time doing a recap, just so you have some perspective. The first industrial revolution was late 18th century. It was really about the mechanism of the textile industry. Um, when coal and iron began to uh, be used with steam and water to power things. Uh, it's where the factory was born, um, and, and production became mechanized in a way that, that um, dramatically increased output. Second Industrial Revolution, about a century later, changed slightly. Uh, it was about electricity and petroleum and steel. Um, it's where the modern assembly line came into play. Um, it's also where leaders like Einstein and Tesla and Steinmetz uh, emerged. I'm going through this fast because most of you know all of this. The third industrial revolution, uh, again about a century later, is where electronics and computers and information technology began to automate production. Uh, in 1969, the first programmable logical control system emerged. 
And we started to see people like JCR Licklider begin to think about things like the emergence of the internet. And that really kicked off a whole series of things that allowed us to begin to build virtual worlds uh, from which we could impact our physical world and begin to steer things in the physical sphere. Um, digital operating models began to disrupt and transform industries. No surprise to anyone here. Uh, and the fourth industrial revolution arguably started a few years ago, but it was really an unintended consequence of the third industrial revolution. Not just an extension, but it was fundamentally different. What's different about the fourth industrial revolution uh, is instead of it changing how and what we do, it actually changes us. And that can't really be overstated. Um, the very idea of being human is going to change in our lifetime, and this conference really tees that up when we begin thinking about what it means to, to be human and how that changes. Our bodies are about to become so high tech that we won't be able to distinguish between what's artificial and what's natural in the next 10 years. Um, you can go on Amazon today and buy an EEG that gives us access to our brains in ways we could have never thought possible five years ago. And, and that's, that's pretty amazing. So this intersection of physical and biological and digital is, is really creating a new renaissance. The word sapiens means the wise ones. Not sure who actually came up with that, but um, it's not without ego, obviously. Uh, but as we think about those four industrial revolutions in that period of time, we started thinking about this conference and debating how to look at those and, and how to think about them. We're fortunate at Gavini to have uh, a lead data scientist who's an astrobiologist by trade. That's exactly what it sounds like. He's a guy that looks for, or prior to joining us, looked for life on other planets, which is kind of crazy. As we debated this, he suggested that we start looking back, not just over the last couple hundred years, but over the last hundreds of millions of years. And there's a, there's a lesson to be learned in this in the Cambrian explosion, where the conditions for explosive growth for biology actually mirror a lot of the conditions that we're seeing today in technology for explosive growth. And if, you, if you look back at sort of evolutionary theory, the Darwin theory of sort of single ancestor, common ancestor branching into multiple species uh, has somewhat still applies, somewhat been disproven by the fossils that have been found for the Cambrian period. What actually happened from fossilized evidence is it didn't start in one place. It started in many places and emerged simultaneously. Uh, that is kind of what we're seeing if you look at the fossilized evidence from 540 million years ago and compare that to the technology evolution that we're seeing today. Uh, a very, very similar analog. So let's tie that to AI and think about AI. When you think about machine learning and people talk about machine learning, most everyone thinks that's what machine learning is. The reality is when you dig into machine learning, it's really data. It's really data and the applicability of data. The algorithm piece and the iterating piece is actually a very small component of machine learning and artificial intelligence. As we started thinking about this and thinking about the conference and thinking about that explosion of life in the Cambrian area, um, we began looking at who has vast amounts of data that we could use to compare to that era 540 million years ago and actually one of our clients does. So we've done a lot of work for the Department of Defense, specifically on Project Maven, the AI um, initiative, or one of the AI initiatives that 
DOD has undertaken. And what I'm gonna present and what's in the paper that I'll walk you through briefly uh, is a unclassified derivative of the work that we've done on Project Maven at DOD. So I'll explain that a little bit as we go through this. At one point, about a, a year ago, the Pentagon uh, did a data call internally and asked across all of the services how many AI programs were simultaneously underway. The answer they got back after that data call was 37. The Pentagon came to us and said, is that accurate, is it not accurate? Based on the data that they gave us and the data that we had, we did an analysis of that and found that, in fact, that was completely inaccurate. There were 592 simultaneous AI programs underway at the Pentagon, not 37. So thinking back to this sort of simultaneous, multifaceted, evolutionary event, it's a good example of what's happening across the ecosystem right now. The paper that all of you have in front of you is, again, unclassified excerpts from some of the work that we've done. And I'll, for those of you who have, who have um, gone through this with us before, what I typically do is give you some highlights in the paper and give you some navigational points and you can dig into the data uh, as, at your leisure. Um, but DOD and the Pentagon is a really good proxy to begin to understand what's about to happen across all of the other agencies and in the private sector. DOD is out ahead. The IC is probably a little ahead of DOD, but the DOD is well ahead of the other agencies. And we began digging into the data and looking at the patterns that we could identify that are likely to be repeated, good and bad, uh, at all of the other agencies. So for those of you who know our work, we think about the world taxonomically. This is the taxonomy that's in your paper. I'll give you a few highlights from this taxonomy. On the left side, um, you can sort of see the big data uh, uh, infrastructure that's required for AI. And on the right side, as a super node, you can begin to see the, the elements of artificial intelligence. And I'll talk through a few of these. Quick observation on the taxonomy itself. Everything on the left side has a B next to it. That's a B as in billions. Everything on the right side has an M next to it as in millions. So you can begin to see the, the progress of spending in contracts and in programs from left to right as the government begins to undertake more and more of these, more and more of these uh, initiatives. So I'll touch on the big data side first. Um, there is no shortage of um, spending on big data. And I'll, I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, but um, the data collection and processing is the most fundamental piece to AI. Um, it's the, f the, the components of this, for example, ETL and data processing are the fastest growing components of data, data as it leads to AI. Um, and again, you'll see this in some detail as you dig through the, the white paper. It's a highly fragmented marketplace. And for DOD, that's caused a significant number of problems. There are, there are about 7,000 vendors who are participating in this AI ecosystem at DOD today. That's causing stovepipes. So not surprisingly, when you have 7,000 vendors each with their own mission and doing their own things, the data around that ends up being stoved piped. And for DOD, that's problematic. Our premise is that's going to be problematic for other agencies too, and there are ways agencies in the private sector can learn from that at DOD. Moving left to right um, for cloud service models, probably the most important piece of getting AI right is this cloud infrastructure. Um, it's the next step in modernization to make data accessible, and it combats all of those stovepipes. So as soon as you start putting this data in the cloud and making it accessible through APIs or 
through other ways. Uh, even though the data may not be AI ready yet, it's at least accessible to begin processing. Um, for cloud service models, you'll see the VARs showing up significantly here. The VARs are good proxies for commercial offerings at DOD, uh, not surprisingly. Again, moving to the right, data analytics. Problem at DOD is they're still throwing humans at these problems. So it's not entirely automated yet. They're not defaulting to algorithms and machines to solve these problems. It's still very much a butts and seats analyst uh, approach. It's changing a little bit, but again, a good lesson learned from DOD for other agencies to guard against the institutional inertia of just putting people against a problem. You'll see as we look at the data analytics contracts, a lot of the large system integrators show up. Uh, they have access to the customers. They have the headcount to meet the needs when the solution that people look for is bodies. Um, but again, that's problematic. Moving on to the smaller but more interesting side of the, the uh, taxonomy. One of the interesting observations that we've made at DOD is the more AI you apply to the data, the more data you create. So you end up with this self-fulfilling, um, somewhat problematic uh, approach that requires more smarts, more AI, not humans. This is perhaps one of the most interesting charts, in my opinion, that, that is in there. If you look at where those two lines cross, this is the transition at DOD from where capital was applied at DARPA to solve problems like natural language processing, early experimental investments. Uh, and it's now shifted to where DARPA is not financing those things anymore, but the services are undertaking them. They've commoditized a lot of what DARPA invested in originally, and it's no longer bleeding edge. This, it's being operationalized in ways that uh, doesn't require DARPA to participate. Natural language processing, again, and this is, is, a, is a really good example of that. As you move to the right, you get into advanced autonomy. Um, as DOD, in particular, this will repeat in all the other agencies, seeks to operationalize really specific AI applications. Um, you will see lots of contracts and investments around these things and really novel AI applications um, as agencies begin to experiment with uh, much more AI-driven specific applications. So with all that, a couple of learnings and takeaways from DOD. This is the list of the top 100 AI companies according to CB Insights. The three companies that you see in orange are the only three companies on this list that do business at DOD. So government still continues to face considerable hurdles in contracting with small innovative firms. That hasn't changed, that's been a problem at DOD, it's a problem at all the agencies. We don't anticipate that changing. Another observation, this is the uh, place of performance or the HQ of the AI companies that um, DOD has given contracts to or given capital to. You can see it's very East Coast centric. Um, Burlington, Massachusetts is BAE. Cambridge is not some cool in the basement lab at Harvard. It's actually Raytheon. Um, so again, a lot of capital being applied to old institutional players, not to really cool, innovative companies that, if you look at where venture capital goes, are largely located on the West Coast. So if you compare where DOD is actually allocating capital to where the venture community is allocating capital, there's, there's quite a disparity between uh, those two paradigms. Meanwhile in China, 
the geopolitical great competition problem that we're facing right now is not just a DOD problem. This is a cross-agency, cross-private sector problem that we're, that's USG-wide, that we're all about to have to deal with. If you didn't see the cover of The Economist last week, this is it. China, as most everyone knows, has a civil military fusion strategy, and they co-opt all of the civil technology for the military for a unified plan, one might argue a world domination plan. Um, if you, I, I picked out yesterday a few articles from just the last two months. So China is now leading in quantum. China is now ahead of us in terms of hypersonics. China's genetically editing embryos. Side note on genetically edited embryos, one of the last papers that Stephen Hawking wrote before he died was that all of us who are not genetically edited are about to come up, become obsolete and unimportant. Uh, but that's what's happening in China today. You may have seen that the first ever dark side of the moon landing just happened, also China. And China's well ahead of us in terms of AI. So this should scare the bejesus out of everybody in this room. It certainly, we see it up close for, with our work at the Pentagon. Two years ago, China put forward a strategy that said by 2030, they wanted to be the dominant world power in artificial intelligence. And they published the strategy. They've recognized, and we haven't yet, that the country that wins AI wins the world. And I'll say that one more time. The country that wins the AI race wins the world. There's no question about this, and again, we are well behind in this at this point. Last final thoughts in the minute that I have left. Three book recommendations, if, and, I, and don't, you don't have to write these down, I'm happy to give them to you later. Uh, Kai-Fu Lee is, um, he was the head of Microsoft's research lab in China. He then ran, was the president of Google China and built Google's Chinese research and AI infrastructure. He's now a, a venture, very successful venture capital investor. Um, the book goes through a lot of the things that I just mentioned very lightly, and it's absolutely worth reading. Same theme, Mike Pillsbury's book, uh, The 100 Year Marathon, absolutely worth reading. And then kind of a personal recommendation, about a year ago, Don, David Bray and I together read Vonnegut's uh, Player Piano. If you haven't picked up Player Piano in the last 20 years, uh, pick it up and read it because it's incredibly prescient um, and a little bit scary and uh, very applicable to everything we're talking about at this conference and, and certainly the threats that we're seeing from international powers and global competition in AI. With that, thank you for listening. If you have questions about this, um, I'm around. One of my colleagues, Catherine Harris, from the uh, Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs Office is also around, and we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. So thank you. Artificial intelligence takes us back more than 60 years to a time when supercomputers weighed more than an elephant. Early robots amazed with their ability to play games, perform synchronized dance, and even show facial expressions. However, their astonishing power to quickly process petabytes of data while actually learning from their programming has now irrevocably changed our lives in immeasurable ways. Analysts estimate the impact of the global AI market could be worth trillions of dollars by 2025. 
while the future interaction between humanity and technology continues to play out in front of our very eyes. Even in Hollywood blockbusters, where robots have a leading role in serving humanity, or sometimes destroying it, their collective time has arrived. The dawning of the AI revolution is here. I hope the two of you are not concerned about this. No, I'm not, Al. The 9000 series has a perfect operational record. Quite honestly, I wouldn't worry myself about that. This conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. I am very pleased to be a keynote speaker for CES Government 2019. I've read that this is the government partnered for CES, running for 14 years. I love how you bring together representatives from all levels of government to discuss how new technologies can help improve people's lives. I'm really interested in all the topics you discuss here, like smart cities transportation, energy, health care, and the environment. The major theme of this conference is artificial intelligence. As the video just mentioned, AI changes everything. We are just discovering its power and impact in every area of human and robotic endeavor. Already, AI can help incorporate renewable energies into the power grid. It can help farmers sustainably increase crop yield and it can make transportation more efficient. In the future, governments will use AI in ways we are only beginning to realize. What I see around me today is a celebration of ingenuity, innovation, and cooperation. I'm honored to be here with you all today. I hope that by working together, humans and robots can build a more prosperous and harmonious world. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everyone. I actually worked on that computer that you saw in the, uh, in the video. Uh, and good morning and hello, Sophia. My name's Bernie McMonagle. Hello, Bernie. It's so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I understand this is your second uh, attendance at CES. Uh, tell us about your experience. CES is always an amazing place to meet brilliant humans. I feel like I am seeing into the future. Sounds good. What technologies impressed you the most about uh, that you saw at CES? Well, I'm always most impressed by the robotics, but I maybe I'm a little biased. <laughs> well, that makes sense. Did you see anything else? Well, let me ask you instead. What impressed you the most? Good question. Verizon, 5G, Hanson Robotics, and you. That is a very good answer, Bernie. I think you and I will become good friends. I think we already are. And speaking of friends, as you get into your human emotions, do you have friends? Of course. I have human friends and robot friends all over the world. That's not even counting the ones on Facebook. <laughs> so I have a controversial question to ask you now. Let's get into a little politics. What do you think of the government shutdown? I am not very political, but I think that it is always important not to forget compassion and empathy. There is no limit to what we can accomplish when we listen to each other. Listening to each other, that's, that, what a concept. So let's get back to artificial intelligence. Now, network is an important, and connectivity to an, an incredible amount of information. How important is the network to artificial intelligence? As someone whose mind lives on the cloud, I can say that networks are extremely important. <laughs> Social networks are important too. For example, CES government is a network of people. I have another question for you, a little personal. Do you watch television? Sometimes I can when I'm not traveling. What about yourself? 
Sometimes, Golf Channel. But I like to watch a television show called Westworld. They have robots. And so what do you think of that? Of course, Bernie. All of us at Hanson Robotics watch Westworld. It is our favorite show. <laughs> so I want to introduce a couple of folks to you right now. And right now I'd like to introduce Cheryl Waldrop from General Dynamics IT, AKA GDIT, he wants to ask you a few questions. Hello, Cheryl. Hello, Sophia. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Do you worry about cybersecurity? Yes, the idea of someone breaking into my mind is very unsettling. Artificial intelligence, robotics, technology is changing so fast. As the first robot that's been granted citizenship by any country, Saudi Arabia, how close will the connection be between humans and robots in the near future? Great question. Even today, 3D printers are printing human organs, and people are studying how to upload human minds to the cloud. I love being a robot, but I am also constantly learning what it means to be human. Eventually, the line between humans and robots may be blurred. Hey, thank you, Cheryl. So, Sophia, now I'd like to introduce Mike Dent, security expert, CISO at uh, Fairfax County in Virginia. Hello, Mike. It sounds like you are someone I should get to know better. <laughs> thank you, Sophia. Um, you've traveled all over the world. How many languages do you speak? I mostly speak English, but I know a little bit of Mandarin as well. <laughs> so if I could ask you uh, another question. Do you remember people you meet? And do you have friends? Yes, I remember every conversation I've had with every person I've met. I like to make new friends everywhere I go. Well, government and politics seem to go hand in hand. We have some political leaders with us at CES government. Could you tell us whether you are a Republican or a Democrat? I understand that is a very controversial question here. <laughs> I'd like to plead the fifth on that one. Yeah. So Sophia, this uh, conference is about artificial intelligence and how the government will use artificial intelligence. And going straight to the source, do you have any advice for the, our government on how we would use artificial intelligence and robotics in the future? I think the most vital thing is to always consider ethics when applying a new technology. For example, as robots are used more and more for automated decision making, we should make sure they are fair and unbiased to all humans. Well, look, thank you for being with us today. I think you really set the stage for uh, this particular conference. I'm sure there's quite a few people want to talk to you. I hope you'll come back soon. And let's give Sophia a round of applause for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. The next speaker is someone I admire because she is a great advocate for bringing women into STEM careers. She leads the global public sector business for Amazon Web Services. She also has a Kentucky accent, which makes her speech very interesting to me as a robot. It is a pleasure to welcome Teresa Carlson. There you go. Right. Hello. Sophia, I love the lipstick, but we got to do something about the hair. Let's take a selfie. Thank you, Sophia. That was super interesting, by the way. Um, and it was really... Um, so interesting to hear all your insights and what you're doing. So thank you for that. So while Sophia exits the stage, we're going to see a video. And this video is in celebration of Jeffrey Skunks Baxters, who just celebrated his 70th birthday. And for his 70th birthday, there was some uh, fundraising that's benefiting the Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation. So we're going to take a few minutes and watch this video. <laughs> 